Thank you so much to all of you who've been following us and giving us feedback and joining us on our channel. And for those of you who haven't yet met us, I'm Jo, my husband Paul, and we've started Essence of Overlanding through a sheer passion of wanting to share our knowledge, our experience, our insights and other people's stories to inspire you to come and join the community of Overland Travelers. So a while back we asked the viewers for some questions, anything that's on their mind that they would like answers to, because it's equally important for us to give you what you need and not just what we think. And today we're going to answer some of those questions for you. So we're going to kick off with the burning question that everybody wants to know is a tour of our vehicle or our vehicles. So Paul is going to take you through. Well, yes, thank you. And it's nice to be back. So our vehicle, we've owned a number of vehicles over many, many years. And the latest vehicle I have is a 80 series Land Cruiser, which is actually Joe's truck. We're rebuilding this truck. The truck is going through a complete phase of rebuild and it's going to be filmed and we're going to put it out there. Uh, the ideas and the values that we talk about, keeping things light, keeping stuff simple, what to take, what not to take, that's all very important. And we do want to share that because it's quite a, important for us to share what we do. We've also got a smaller truck, which is a short wheelbase Prado, and we've just done a fantastic series called Overhaul Overland. So if you haven't watched it, guys, go onto that channel, have a look, see. It's about a process of what you do to approach buying a used vehicle to get into overlanding, what mechanical work needs to be done. It's a whole process of sharing knowledge and experience using our knowledge, my knowledge, knowledge from, from experts in the field, building up a team that you can put your vehicle together. So please look at it, like it, subscribe, share it. Uh, it's what we're trying to do is put our knowledge and experience out there. So you will get to see our truck <laughs> and Joe's truck. So if we go on, the next question is, how do I know who to believe when I am starting out and so that I feel confident? There's a lot of information out there. It can be terribly confusing. But the most important thing that Paul and I are passionate about is find out the person's experience. Yeah. How long have they been in the game? Have they overlanded? How many times? One trip doesn't constitute I'm an expedition specialist. How long have they been doing it? How mechanically minded, how experienced are they in the entire spectrum of the world of overlanding? And also, are they relationship builders? Because you want these people to care about you, your needs, and, and accommodate what you want out of your experience and not sell you what they need. Yeah, I do think it's important, you know, you've got, to, you've got to build that relationship, as Joe says, but you've also got to understand that the people have in a business a need to sell you something. So if you're going to a fitment center, they have products that they like and they want to put onto your vehicle for good reason. They've got good associations with where they buy them, the profit they make on them. So it's driven from a business perspective. And what you want is you want someone to actually advise you from a perspective of what's in your best interests. What's going to serve you best to build up your vehicle? What products to put on? What do you need? What don't you need? And what are the time frames that you could work to? So, yeah. And I think one of the things is, does this person have the ability to meet you where you're at and not sell you the whole enchilada, but rather walk you through step by step, stage by stage, while building your con because that's what's going to build your confidence not when you go into the overwhelm of this whole big project and you don't know where to begin which is where the question came from you want somebody to be able to walk you through the journey and all the while building your confidence yeah great thanks <clears throat> the next question is what is vital to carry for each country around food money and clothing mm -hmm. so if, if we look at food keep it simple keep it basic there are recipe books out there where people make suggestions, there's always food on the road, but make sure you've got emergency supplies because you could break down and you always want to have backup. Comes to clothing, it's a very personal thing, but rather take, especially if it's your first expedition, take more than less. You will cull with practice, but the mm. most important thing is take durable clothing that really takes the pounding and the hammering of washing and wearing, etc. You want quick dry clothing. And the other thing is because of the varied weather patterns throughout Africa and other countries, of course, you want to layer. 
So like currently I've got something under this, I've got this, I've got this, and then I would put layers on because the weather changes throughout the day and you, you want to be comfortable. And of course your footwear is equally important. Make sure you've got covered footwear, solid footwear, not flimsy footwear that also supports your feet. Paul, you got anything? Yeah, you know, when it comes to money, it is a difficult scenario, but you do need to carry a certain amount of cash because you might get a scenario where you're caught out, you can't draw money, some place doesn't take a credit card, or there's a medical emergency. So I say to people, if you're taking credit cards, take different type of credit cards. If a Visa or MasterCard, you can get travel cards. Take enough cash, and if you're traveling in Africa, it's predominantly US dollars. So you've got all that at your disposal. And, and make sure you've got a, a, an emergency backup plan. If you had a medical emergency or an accident or something, you've got something you can pay. You can put a credit card down for a medical emergency. And that's really important. And I always say to people, work to a budget. Each day that you take your budget, you're gonna use for that day. What you don't spend, put it into a little kitty, if you wanna put it like that. And every now and then, just go and spoil yourselves. Maybe you didn't spend for a week half your budget. And now you can actually go and you can just have a nice day in a lodge or something. So very important on that. Credit cards can be stopped. So make sure that if you've got something that you're using, you've got someone back home who can actually sort that problem out for you. There's nothing worse when you're on the road, something's gone wrong with a credit card, and you're trying to make phone calls from a poor connection or a satellite phone to deal with us. And it can be really frustrating and costly. So put that in, pla in place. And it says, Joe's spoken about food. Yeah, I mean, I think I love going into the markets. It's half the fun. So the next question, also for Paul, is about suspension, what's necessary and what's not necessary. I could do a whole episode on this. It's a very in-depth topic to discuss and there's quite a few things to actually consider. But the basis is that your springs carry the weight on the vehicle. The more weight you're gonna put in the car, the stronger the springs need to be. The shock absorbers are there to actually control the, the movement of the springs. The spring will compress and as it comes back up, the shock absorber is going to slow down that process and control the car. What do you need and what you don't need? Well, essentially, safety is your critical element. So suspension is critical, especially when you add weight to the vehicle. Your aim is to make sure that the vehicle is going to be stable in, un in dif difficult conditions that you're driving. So if you're driving on corrugations, you're driving on difficult terrain, you want to make sure that the truck is safe and that you can control it. That's the basic aim of putting a suspension in. And I think that's the main focal point. We can always go into more depth on some of our other channels that you can have a look at. And then the next one is, is overlanding possible in a two by four bucky or an SUV? And it would be yes to both. Um, yeah, I agree, absolutely. You know, any vehicle, you see people who've done amazing trips, people who've driven through Africa in cars. It doesn't mean to say you can't go exploring in any type of vehicle. I mean, we take classic cars across some of the most ridiculous places in the world. These are cars which you wouldn't think would make it, but they were designed in that time when the roads weren't that good. So the answer is yes. What you're trying to do when you're choosing a vehicle is you're trying to make sure that the vehicle you take is suitable for your needs. If you're doing a weekend, you can put up with pretty much anything. You've got to understand where you're taking the car. You're not going to take your two by four into the dunes unless you're prepared to push it out. It's going to be challenging. And your SUV is more of a combination between a city and an off-road vehicle. So understand what your vehicle is designed for. Don't be fooled into the idea that just because it's an SUV and the ad says you can take it anywhere in the world, you, can, you can't, you can do that. You can, provided you understand the conditions you're taking it through and that you prepare. And again, it's about looking. The more remote you go, the more you need a vehicle that you can fix. It's simple, it's reliable, you can get help. And that's where we fall back onto choosing the right vehicle for the right sort of conditions. But the answer is yes. So the other biggie, and we did do an episode some while back about now's the time since the pandemic. The question now is, will COVID change the way we overland travel? Well, it has already because for a number of people, air travel has become very um, expensive. So going and traveling more locally in their own vehicles and people are now becoming more interested in four wheel drive vehicles. So yes, it has already changed the way people travel. 
people are wanting more mm. purpose and meaning. They, they're also very mindful of going into cluttered and crowded spaces like hotels and busy cities and, and shops and big tourist attractions where you get hordes of, of people and busloads. So people are wanting to go more off-road, off the beaten track and go and have the quiet, go and have the stillness because, you know, lockdown brought many gifts and it brought silence. And now that things have reverted to a measure of normality, people are seeking the silence again. And overlanding is actually giving them that, that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the next thing is, what are the maps to use? And is there an app or just use a Garmin? So Paul and I are firm believers in maps and Tracks for Africa are tried and tested the most reliable. Why? For because Africa, it's... Yeah. Tracks for Africa, for oh. Africa, yes. Thank you. Because you've got the overall atlas and then you've got the maps per region. And what's beautiful about it is they've got very accurate distances and times. So you can pretty much plan your days as much as allowed and decide where you're going to go or travel for how far and how long based on those maps. So we really, and, and there's also an app that you can download. And, and get an electronic version. And then of course, a Garmin GPS is always useful. But in terms of all the other apps, less is more, as Paul would say. Yeah, I think you know, Joe's right. The mapping for me is very important. I do like a paper map. It's a lovely talking point when you're discussing. It's great to plan as well. You know, half the fun in the trip is to plan the next trip. That's what most of us do. And the atlas and and you know I, I've always looked at what's available and you can have again too many maps um, I found that more and more information is coming online to support you with your trips and travels but it doesn't beat pulling a map out and asking a local person in the place you are what can you see and explore in their place they're gonna tell you the best places they're probably gonna tell you stuff that's not in the guidebooks and not so on the map. I, yeah, and I love that because that's part of the interaction and connection with people. A GPS for me is a safety critical piece of equipment because if in any scenario you needed to call for help, you need to be able to give someone your coordinates of where you are. And that's really important. But don't be fooled into just following a GPS. That can lead you astray. Use a map in com combination with a GPS, in combination of knowing which direction you're going in. And take navigation as a as a whole balance of a number of supporting aids and not just following a GPS. Exactly. And as many maps as there are, there are as many answers to your questions. And that's why we cannot answer everything in one episode. So please keep submitting your questions. We love hearing from you and mm. we'll be sharing the Q&As as the episodes unfold. Thank you so much to all of you who've made our films possible. We really appreciate all the support you've given us. If you'd like to continue this journey with us, please like and subscribe or support us through Patreon.